Um, is it a number theory talk or a machine learning talk? It's not going to be quite clear. <laughs> so um, I, I hope. Uh, uh, so please, if you're like from one perspective and you want to know how, how this relates, um, definitions from another perspective, please just plus slow, slow me down, stop me, um, rewind me, whatever you want. Um, and also tomorrow, um, you know, this is a very going to be a very high level talk. Um, tomorrow, um, I'm going to give a more detailed talk, but what details I give depend on, will depend on your request. So think about what parts you'd like to see more of, and I'll try to do more of those parts tomorrow. Okay. Um, and what parts you want to see less of. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, and, uh, you know, we sort of divide up are according to our little into little subgroups just because and study like single issues because how do you deal with a you know with everything at once how do you deal with all of mathematics all of computer science uh, it would just be too much to, to to tangle so we sort of like try to divide up our plate and in, into different areas and, and each eat from a different area but so often we find that <laughs> what we think of uh, as different really turn out to be the same. And so um, this is what I call the spaghetti theory of at least mathematics, but probably like everything in life, is you may try to be a specialist, but it's kind of impossible because when you dig deeply, you also, uh, in one, on one thing, you also come into all sorts of connections with other things. So, um, so this is a, a kind of project that started by sort of exploring certain strands of spaghetti, but led all over the place. Okay. So, um, so the question is, when can we find simple models of complex objects? So um, this comes up in science because you're studying some complex object like the weather, and you want some kind of mathematical model for that complex object. Okay. Or in mathematics, Maybe we have this huge graph, and we want to find a simple representation of that graph that captures the high-level structure of the graph. Okay. And in learning, we want to find some kind of way of describing some kind of data that we've seen, uh, generalizing it, and, and uh, seeing what the pattern is to, to come up with some kind of simple model of where this data is coming from. Okay. So, um, so what we're going to see is that these, these, these three viewpoints are really very connected. So let's start with models in science, um, just to sort of like get, uh, get a kind of direction to go in. Um, so let's say that you're a scientist and you're studying butterflies, okay? So you're, and you're going off collecting butterflies to study. Um, and you want to under, but you're collecting butterflies to understand the uh, kind of nature of butterflies in general, not because you're interested in these particular butterflies. Okay, so um, now, as a scientist, there isn't there. You can only you're kind of limited to what you can me uh, measure or um, otherwise um, otherwise categorize. Um, so you can like determine like the wingspan of these butterflies, the color of the butterflies. You can, uh, you can say what the proboscis size of the butterflies is, but you're not going to like characterize them by aesthetic value or something. Okay. So, um, so there's lots of maybe interesting things about butterflies that you can't actually capture with one of your experiments, but there's a whole range of, of uh, measurements that you can capture with your experiments. Okay. Um, and so um, you want uh, some kind of mathematical model of the, that describes the distribution of butterflies. And uh, so there, there are a couple of different approaches um, in the philosophy of science for what a, what a good model would entail. A strict realist would say, what makes a model good is it's the truth. Okay? And the truth means that every concept in your model should be something that would make sense 
to butterflies, or at least to butterfly collectors. Okay? You can't have some kind of artificial uh, uh, parameters added to your model that don't have an interpretation in terms of butterflies. Okay? Um, so everything in your model should be really meaningful as far as sort of the life cycle of butterfly goes. Species could be in it, age could be in it, but um, something like, uh, uh, I don't know, I'm finding it hard to think of irrelevant categories for butterflies, <laughs> you know, but just uh, some bizarre linear combination of these things, you know, m might not be meaningful, doesn't have a clear interpretation. So uh, you could drop that a little bit and say, um, uh, well, we'll be okay if we, you know, and we can have all sorts of artificial parameters, but the distribution of butterflies that is predicted by our, our model should be the real distribution of butterflies. Okay. Um, though, even though when you think about it, what is the real distribution of butterflies? Do we really, are we talking about butterflies in that particular forest? All butterflies, you know, is that forest supposed to be representative of all butterflies uh, that could exist? Um, what level are we talking about? Okay. Um, because, you know, we don't want to like be overfitting the butterflies that we've seen, even though, though we want to ad adopt something that's real about the butterfly distribution. And maybe um, a pragmatist would say, I don't care about whether it's real or not. What I care about is that it makes accurate predictions. Okay? So if my model says that if the proboscis size is bigger than five centimeters, then the body length should be bigger than two centimeters, I should be able to go measure that and, it's, and it should be true in the real world. Okay. Um, so is this distinction clear? So let's look for, let's concentrate on just the pragmatic point of view for now. So the pragmatic point of view is we've got some kind of simple tests that we can use for experiments and those are the same tests that can be sort of features that we can include in our model. And the, they're also the same features we want to be able to predict. So we're not going to have all the different tests that we could do in our model. We want to select some tests, but be able to use those in our model to predict the values of others. Okay. And, um, and what, we're, what we're asking for uh, from just having predictive power is that our predictions, the expectation of different of the other tests should be accurate as far as the, the distribution is concerned. Okay. Um, so, um, okay. So, we'll, let's shift gears a bit and say, uh, and look at the, the kind of mathematical question of how mathematicians think about um, modeling complex objects as, uh, in a, as simple models. And uh, so what a mathematician is, is more worried about rather than reality or, or truth is sort of like looking at getting the big picture right but saying that the, the details look kind of randomish. Okay? So even, I guess, there's some structure even to this kind of close up of what's going on, but there's also seems to be, you know, it seems to be more closer to the truth to say this dot is where it is because of randomness than because the painter specifically chose to put the dot here rather than ha half a millimeter to the north. Okay, so, um, so, so often mathematical structures have a kind of high level structure, but low level randomness. And even if you're looking at like a, a fixed structure, like the distribution of the primes, you really care about what sense is it, is it structured to what sense is it random or pseudorandom. Okay. So, um, so both of these share a kind of similar uh, abstract setting. Okay. Um, so we have a probability distribution over some kind of object. Okay. Um, in, in the painting is a probability distribution over like 
particular pixels. So we're saying look at random pixels, the placement, the color, that's the, that's the distribution. So we can, like, even if we're talking about a deterministic object, we can look at its components as forming a distribution. Okay. And there's some um, a priori distribution um, over all objects of that category. We often think of that as the uniform distribution, doesn't need to be. And we have a class of tests that we're interested in estimating. Okay. Um, so uh, the distribution might be complex. We'd like to find a simple distribution um, so that it's indistinguishable via tests, meaning that this distribution D prime gives accurate predictions for D about this, this category of tests. And so it may not be really close to D in any sense, but it gives accurate predictions about D. So is uh, the kind of goal clear? So you take that particular painting, take that one painting, and look at the distribution of <coughs> points and colors. So colored points. So pick a random point on the, the painting and look at the color. You know, so the, the x, y, and, and col color value. So, a Boolean test is one or zero. Sometimes we'll think about it as one and negative one. It's going to be convenient so that we're like, when we're like adding and subtracting the number of times we got it correct minus the number of times we got it wrong. I think for this talk, I made everything zeros and ones consistently, but I don't promise that. <laughs> so, um, now we could, it, everything goes through with tests with, val with values between zero and one. If they're not in a bounded range, then things get messy. Much more complicated. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so simple here. We're going to say a model is simple if it's definable in term in terms of the same kind of tests and relatively few of them. Okay. So we're looking at um, the uh, functions where we take some k tests in our class, and then we have some combiner function, and we evaluate the k functions on our input, and then use the combiner function to give, give us the final answer. Okay. Um, and the combiner function you know, might be um, you know, giving us a kind of weight for the input rather than just saying yes, no, it's in the, in the set. So this combiner function could maybe won't be Boolean, but might be in the range zero to one. Okay, um, and in fact, we're going to like look at uh, our distribution not as giving us the probability of elements, but giving has giving us this kind of weight that we're going to sample with respect to. So, um, so what we're going to say is the the our model is going to be in, in the presented in the format of a measure where measure is just a function from the universe to the range zero to one. Zero meaning don't keep, don't, don't use this at all. One, definitely use it, uh, and somewhere in between, use it with that probability. Okay. So, um, so the measure is going to have this form, and then it induces the distribution where we use this measure to do rejection sampling, um, to create a distribution, to make, a, th make the probability of an element proportional to its measure. So, um, so we say we pick x at random from the uniform distribution and then keep it with this probability and otherwise resample. Now, um, for the efficiency of this, this sampling procedure is going to depend on the expected value of the measure and which we'll call the density of the measure. And that's going to be very important for us for, for a number of reasons. One of which is the, the efficiency of sampling, but it's going to come up in a, a number of other ways as well. So we should think of G as uh, giving us, giving us uh, well, G of T1 through T, Tk is mu, is u. Um, we'll also be looking at, there's like another case where we're using it in a different, uh, 
Okay. So, um, so this this clear. This is uh, first kind of like chunk of notation. So I want to make sure <laughs> this this is we're going to be using this a lot. Uh, Rich, did you have a question? Oh, um, so, okay, so maybe the individual tests are like uh, um, things like at maybe like filters over a, a region, you know, giving average color over a region, okay. And then um, G is going to, um, is going to like, so a typical thing we're going to do is see how, how many of these are kind of like uh, true for a point. So I want to say, is a point sort of looking like it's from this distribution, uh, saying like, well, if it's in a certain region, we want the average value to be about such and such. And the, the closer it is to these filters, the higher weight we're going to give it. So we might like, say, oh, let's look at the, the sets that it belongs to. The ones it doesn't belong to, uh, that contributes zero. We, if it's close to the ex average color in the place where it belongs, then we're going to give it a, a certain probability, a more, more likely probability. If it's far from the average color, then we'll give it a, a I'm just sort of making this up, so. Sure. OK. Yeah. Right. Features. Does it have a nose? Does it have an eye? Does it? Is it ovular? Yeah. Roughly, things like that. So those are Boolean. So those. Are, these are Boolean. But then we're going to combine them in a way. Yeah. 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 Is is so so when we use it in this context, we're going to always guarantee that the output is between zero and one uh, because we want to use it as a probability. The range of G is a, is zero one. Yeah. Uh, in in this in this use, we'll also see where there's going to be another use where the range of G has to be exactly zero or one. Okay. So um, so here here are like some settings that we can use this framework for. Uh, so uh, one, one, one thing that, that's like a clean to visualize is maybe we've got like, like, like this painting um, has an additional dimension color, but otherwise it's like if you just looked at the outline of a painting, it would be a distribution of points on a, on a square. Okay, so, um, so you know, we're thinking of the distribution of, say, the, the dark points in a, in a painting. Okay, so maybe we've got like some squiggles. And uh, the, the kind of tests that we want are things like uh, look at triangular regions and see how much of the distribution, much of the painting lies within that triangle and compare it to the volume of the triangle. Okay. Um, so we'd want a model, a simple model that preserves triangles. We might just say, oh, well, this is a squiggle, but I'll just estimate it as a circle. That's simpler, but um, as far as like the amount within the triangles, it's about the same. Does that make sense? Okay. So, um, or we could have uh, in computational complexity, we're interested in tests that have uh, uh, that are, can be efficiently computed. So the tests, we might be looking at the distribution of all strings of length n, and the tests we care about are those with relatively small circuit complexity. Okay. 
Um, in number theory, we might be looking at the, the distribution of random primes. And, uh, and so we care about um, the, the basic universe is random numbers up to some fixed n. The distribution is random primes up to n. And the class of tests is something suitable for primes that I don't really understand. <laughs> okay. And this is actually one of the starting, the starting point for a lot of this work came from the study of primes. Um, I'm not sure if I'll have time to actually explain why. Or I, I certainly don't have the knowledge to explain why. <laughs> so um, another, another really interesting case where a lot of the other, a lot of ideas also came from is graph theory, where um, the dis we're looking at a particular graph, but we're thinking of it as the distribution of edges of the graph among the universe of all possible edges. And we're looking at the tests are going to be cuts in the graph, two disjoint sets A and B, and does the, the edge go between A and B? Okay. Um, or we could be looking at images, and we want, like, say, the, the class of tests computable by um, neural nets of a certain configuration. So, like, threshold circuits with a certain structure. Okay. Yes? Oh, this this is this should be a, a slanted T. <laughs> so, uh, so each individual function is zero one. Slanted boldface T is the class of all such functions that we care about. Okay, so we're gonna so so maybe we're like the class is like lo all linear functions and, and I messed up here so this should be like the same slanted <laughs> T as here but saying here where we we want to talk so we're going to be using particular T's but in our in our model the kind of T that we're restricted to is from this class of tests Sure. Check if a person is a person in this room. Right. And that's the slanty T, and then the straight T is are you you? Are you you? That's right. Okay. Yeah, is the individual. So uh, is this a, so like script T might be pictures that are close to someone in the room, and each individual T is um, pictures close to, is this a picture of a person in the room? Particular person. Okay, um, so here, here we're looking at the the class of cuts. Each particular T represents a particular cut. Okay, and maybe I should have used more distinctive <laughs> distinctive fonts, but. Um, well. Okay, I'm thinking of the trained threshold circuit, the th trained network as returning itself <laughs> rather than just a value. So I'm thinking of the function it will return, okay, the, overall the overall function, function not just <laughs> a particular value. So. <coughs> Let's say, yeah. Okay, so the class, neural nets being used as classifiers. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, okay, so um, what, what a lot of the results in this area are about are distinguishing between set distributions that look small and those that look large. So I'm going to give like a formal definition of what it means for a distribution to look large, because that's going to be the guarantee when we when we have um, a simple model. Okay, um, so a distribution. Uh, we're going to just use this notation. If we have a test 
and a distribution, we're just going to let t of that distribution be the expected value. And because this is a 0, 1 value test, that's just the probability that the test says 1. Okay. Um, and a distribution has actual density bigger than d. If a distribution has actual density d, it's like bigger, the uniform distribution on a bigger than d fraction of the, the space, then for any kind of measurable amount uh, that's bigger than 0, the, the, um, the expected value under the uniform distribution is going to be at least the probab you know, we're thinking of the probability of conditionally sampling from the distribution of d that we care about is at least d, and then times the expected value in from that. Because even if it was 0 outside, this would be a lower bound on the, on the, on the, um, on the, the expectation. Yeah. If, if you can write the rad, the rad only got in with respect to the bag measure, that would be the density of distribution. It's, a bit, uh, it's completely different what you mean, right? Probably, but <laughs> I, I didn't think of, so, okay. so the density function, but, yeah. but I think, um, no, no, I understand. Yeah. It's just 80% of, I think, of theory would call the distribution having a density from a very different, uh, yeah, but then you're talking about a density function, yeah. and here we're talking about like a right. fix, so, so we're saying the density function is sort of lower bounded. Uh, the average of the, that density function yeah. is a little lower bounded by d. I think it's clear, it's just... Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, there are only so many words to go around. <laughs> 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 and so sometimes we have to repeat them, <laughs> Re reuse them. Yeah. So this is d, uh, just, just so that I understand, this uh, small d, is it supposed to be a number bigger than 1 or smaller than Smaller one? than 1. Okay. It's be between 0 and 1, because you can't... You can't can't be, uh, well, I guess this could be true when it's bigger than 1, but um, it won't be true of, say, like the, the null test. <laughs> that just gives you value 1. Okay. So, um, so uh, okay. But this, the thing is that even though such a set that violated this, where this would show that the distribution is less than d, has density less than d, uh, if you reverse this inequality, uh, it wouldn't necessarily be like effective to, to even, you, even if this test is simple, it wouldn't be necessarily effective to show that the distribution is small using this test. Because you'd have to sort of estimate both sides. And if both sides are very close to 0, you would need a huge number of samples from the two distributions before you could tell that this was a counterexample. So we're going to weaken it to say, not only is it, a, is it a, you know, not only going to insist that it be a counterexample, but a counterexample where these two sides are both non-negligible. And for that, we're going to put in uh, a small factor, a small error term, E. Yeah? So I got lost here. So where, so you switched from T being the test and talking about T being the, yeah. the second line, right? Now you switch to S of U. Right? Yeah. So now I'm going back to T, but say, so this is, this is sort of the definition in real life of what density means. Okay? So it means for all sets, this would be true. So the distribution really is dense. If everything, definable or not, this is true. Okay? Now we're saying, oh, can there be, can we actually prove that this is not true using just the test that we care about? Okay? So pseudo-dense means you can't prove that it's not true just using test from t. Okay. It, so if you if you had all powerful tests s, you could prove it's not true. But if you're limited to t and time e, then time roughly one in e, then you can't prove it via via the test that we care about. Okay. And so we say that pseudo dense, if there's no suitably um, big counterexample to this that's in the class of tests we care about. Okay? So, um, so, so, so that mean, means that uh, I, I, t of u is always bigger than d times t of d, but minus a small error term. 
um, for the test we care about. So, so it could be less, but only if the test is really, you know, only if these two probabilities are much less than E. So, so you, you are restricting to, perhaps this is without rationality, but you're restricting to like one-sided uh, tests uh, between the distributions? Mm. In some sense, like I could. No, because no, it's saying, oh, oh well, so uh, I'm looking at density of D within U rather than U within D. So, so I, I care about, I'm, I'm th thinking of U as the uniform distribution. So U is as spread out as possible. And I'm trying to say, when is D not clustered in too narrow a, a neighborhood within U? So I don't care about the reverse direction. And D could be like a very small number, like one in a thousand. Um, so we're just saying U is not less, we're not saying that U and D are close, we're saying that U is not less than a, we can't witness that U is concentrated in a region of less than one in a thousandth of U. Okay? Maybe true, but we can't actually pinpoint that region within T. Okay, and uh, one way to be pseudo-random is to be actually, pseudo-dense is to be actually dense or dense in a distribution actually dense within a sub-distribution that looks like the uniform distribution as far as testing in, in T goes. Okay, okay. so, um, so there are three kinds of, in the different areas, there were three kinds of kind of decomposition of an object into uh, a structured part and a random part. And it will turn out that these three kinds of decomposition are all very related to each other. Okay. The first um, is uh, the hardcore set lemma from, um, from computational complexity. Uh, and I'm looking at mainly at Holenstein's version of this. Okay. So, um, so it says, let's say we've got a, a Boolean function on the universe. And we want to like, quantify how hard it is. So say we'll say that um, it's going to be hard if any simple combination of tests can't predict the function more than one minus d of the time. Okay. So there's a any way of so we have some distribution on inputs and any way of trying to compute f fails at least d fraction of the time. Of course, different ways of trying to compute it might fail on in different ways. Okay. Say, oh, okay, even though different ways of trying to compute it might fail in different ways, actually what this lemma is, says is that there's actually just one region where all the failures are concentrated. And that's called the hardcore set. So the hardcore distribution is a distribution that is really density at least two times d. And f looks like on this distribution, f, as far as tests in, in t are concerned, looks like a random bit. You can't guess it more than 50% of the time, more than, more than negatively more than 50% of the time. Okay. So, um, so that's an, that 2D region is exactly enough to explain why the function is hard to compute D of the time. Everything is failing D of the time because it's failing half the, half the points in this distribution. They could be failing at different halves but that's because they're making like different random guesses within that distribution. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, a second decomposition theorem came from um, number theory, additive, additive or additive combinatorics, and was motivated by studying the primes. It's by Green, Tau, and Tau and Ziegler, although there are some. Um, Pre also related versions from com computational complexity uh, around the same time. Um, so if, if D is, and actually the, the version I'm giving is a simplification of the, of the versions that were, were earlier in term, this terms of pseudodensity. So it says that one of two situations has to happen. Okay? For any distribution, either it's not pseudodense which means that you've got some kind of simple test that's a composition of tests in your, a uh, small number of tests in your, in your, from, of your basic type. 
that pinpoints where that distribution lies. So shows that that distribution has relatively small support. Okay? Or you have a very simple model that's, um, that's large and, um, and uh, is indistinguishable from your, your di actual distribution via tests of the kind you care about. You know, so it doesn't, this is the, the orange thing is a simple distribution that's modeling the uh, complicated distribution that's small support but kind of spread out. So even though these two distributions aren't close, they're indistinguishable, say, by straight lines. You know, about the right fraction is going to be um, on either side of any kind of straight line you draw. At least I was trying to make that possible in the picture. <laughs> Okay. I, I think I may have forgotten something. So the GK of T was the class of uh, uh, the combining, so combining, combining functions. functions. Yeah. What is HK of T? HK of T is a related class. <laughs> so saying like there are two kinds of combiner functions, G and H in this. Okay. I'm not spelling out. Okay. And you can come up with different choices of those. Uh, so there are different proofs of this lemma that all involve different Gs and different what Hs. That's right. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't get this part. Is, is G and H, uh, is it for some G and then there is an H that goes with it? Or? So there are two classes of functions. So this is more like a family of lemmas. <laughs> and so there are many different classes of functions G and many different classes of a functions H that you can use as the kind of outside function. So each one is just combining a small number of, of things within the within the um, the basic test that we care about but some are doing it by by like linear functions some are doing it by exponential functions and so on uh, so uh, so um, I should say that that yeah so they're they're like different instantiations of this and we're going to get get to that um, thing that we had the same situation here, uh, different instantiations of how to combine things to get the, the strong predictor or the, the combine things to get the hardcore distribution. Okay. Um, it's going to turn out that those different, even though each one has different combinations of G and H that you can use, they're the same, each one translates to the, from one picture to the next with the same G and H. Uh, okay, and uh, in uh, a similar thing is a regularity lemma uh, started with Zemmer actually sort of went in the reverse direction. Zemmerity gave the strong version that was hard to prove, and then uh, uh, Fries and Kanan gave the kind of like more intuitive, <laughs> easier version <laughs> um, that isn't as strong much later, um, called weak regularity lemma, but having much better parameters. Uh, so it says that if you've got a distribution, and, and this one came up in graph theory first, um, but it says if the distribution is actually dense, then there's a model that's simple. Okay? And you can kind of like note that the dense model theorem uh, strictly generalizes the weak regularity lemma. Because if you're actually dense, then in particular you're pseudo-dense, and this part of the picture won't happen. So you get the same picture over here. So being a model means being indistinguishable? Being indistinguishable via the same class of tests. OK. And so, uh, OK. So what we're going to, what we show uh, is that there's a generic transformation between these, these three kinds of decomposition theorems. Any kind of hardcore set with any G and any H uh, and any K gives you a corresponding dense model theorem with the same G, H, and K. And that gives you the same, as I sketched, that gives automatically the same weak regularity theorem. So K is the number of tests that you need to combine to get either the distribution or the, um, and uh, it's going to also be like the number of rounds you need in boosting. 
Okay. Um, and so by going through these reductions, we can sort of like get optimal values for the weak regularity lemma by optimizing the hardcore distribution set. Okay. Is there a loop? I don't have a, I don't have, there's some, I don't have a tight loop. So you can go backwards and lose some parameters, but I don't want to lose parameters. <laughs> um, okay. Actually, yeah. Uh, and say so that that my main contribution is in this step. Uh, this some of the other connections were observed by Rheingold, Trevisan, Tulsiani, and Vidal. We'll see that um, to to go from a strong hardcore to a strong regularity. Uh, but the way I do that is sort of reinterpret the existing proofs of strong regularity in, as boosting out as proofs of the hardcore set lemma. So I don't have a gen, I don't have a completely generic way of doing that. But um, okay. Um, Okay, so here's how we go from hard course sets to dense model theorems. Okay, we're going to um, pick some parameter d prime carefully. It's, it's, it, you know, it turns out to be the only thing you can pick. Okay, to make things work out. Um, and I'm going to be, you know, our distribution might have very small support. So we want to like say, use are you a member of our distribution? as the hard function to guess, but, uh, okay, right. So we're going from this hardcore set lemma that says that any function that's hard to compute at least d fraction of the time actually has this hardcore where it's almost like, it's almost pseudo-random. And we're trying to go to this uh, dichotomy between pseudo-density, not having pseudo-density, being pigeonholeable, and having a, a, a model that si that's simple and looks like the, the distribution. Okay. Um, so we have some set that we're trying to model, find a model for, and we want to map that to a function that where the hardcore for that function will give us the model for the set. Okay. And so we have to define some function that has something to do with the set. And so I want to say, well, the, the obvious thing is like, are you a member of the set? What else can you do? But the problem is the set is very small support. A good heuristic for that function is just say, no, you're not a member of the set. So we're going to artificially blow up the set to make it comparable, you know, so make that heuristic fail. Okay. So we're going to look at a new distribution, a new kind of uniform distribution, where with probability some d prime, we sample from our, our set that we're trying to model. And with the remaining probability, we sample from the uniform distribution. Maybe in the uniform distribution, there's also some, some, a few elements that are from the set. We don't care. Okay? We're going to label these um, with f equals 1 and these with, I should have been f equals 0, but um, to, to be consistent by Boolean functions. So we're going to say this side is the 1s, that side is the 0. So, on this side, you're correctly saying f is 1. Um, and so um, now, when you pick d prime, or the exact right value, a counterexample to pseudo density for s becomes exactly a way of computing f with error less than d prime. Okay? Um, the two are just equivalent, the way we've set it up. So the, the assumption that S has pseudo density means that there's no way of computing F um, be better than 1 minus delta prime. Okay. So the, um, the hardcore distribution lemma says that there is a distribution of size 2 delta prime where the function looks like a random bit. Well, because the, the function is supposed to look like a random bit on that distribution, it had better be balanced. So it has to have d, d prime from this side and d prime from this side. Okay. 
Well, d prime from this side can only be the whole thing. Okay. And d prime from this side is a d prime over 1 minus d prime, which turns out to be exactly d, uh, density measure within u. And that side is going to be the model. I hope I, I, so the hardcore, actually I should, so the, the hardcore for, for F has to look like all of S and an equal size fraction of U. And this equal size fraction of U is exactly uh, saying that you can't guess wh which of these two you're from better than 50-50 is exactly saying that this is indistinguishable from this. And um, saying that it's equal size is exactly saying that it's the right fraction, uh, it's the fraction of u that we're looking for. OK. Um, OK. Now, this, is, this reduction is very simple. And so um, if we've got an algorithm that's going to improve, if we could have an algorithm that's the, the proof of the, the hardcore set lemma, then we get an algorithm that proves the, the dense model theorem. Uh, algorithmic version of dense model theorem follows from an algorithmic version of the hardcore set lemma. And actually, it turns out that the algorithmic version of the hardcore set lemma is really well known. It's just the boosting technique from machine learning, or suitable versions of the boosting technique from machine learning. And that was actually like observed way back in the 90s by Clive and Zenza video. Uh, OK. So, and you know, kind of excitedly, boosting is such a successful technique that a lot of effort has been put, devoted to optimizing boosting and gives us a lot of different boosting algorithms to pick from. Each one is going to give us a, a, each one of, or many of these different boosting algorithms that we have to pick from. They have to have a one, one parameter that boosting people don't normally care about <laughs> um, optimized. Other than that, each one gives us a different kind of algorithmic dense model there. And then I'm going to try to convince the learning theory people that they actually care about algorithmic dense model theorems. OK, so, um, in, so what is a boosting algorithm? You have an unknown function on the uniform distribution, okay, on some distribution. And you've got an a unspecified subroutine that you specify some distribution by a measure. And, um, and this weak learner produces a hypothesis from your class of tests that it doesn't compute the function everywhere on that distribution, just has some small advantage in computing the function on that distribution. So it correlates with the function a half plus epsilon of the time. Okay. Um, and uh, the goal is to output a function that agrees with the function almost everywhere. So the weak learner doesn't, but that's what we want to do, to use this weak learner to give a strong learner. Okay. Um, so the weak learner is an algorithm that, given a distribution, returns a hypothesis. So while the, there's one weak learner algorithm, it's being used a number of times in producing a sequence of hypotheses. Uh, okay. uh, I hope I answered that question. I think so. You're trying yeah. to find some function f. Right. And then Right. So, so we're going to say, like, we're going to start with running the weak learner on the uniform distribution. It's going to give us a hypothesis that it computes the function, say, 51% of the time. We're going to modify the distribution to favor things where that first hypothesis was wrong so that we can get a second hypothesis from the weak learner that computes it, again, 51% of the time on the modified distribution, but it's getting the right answer on a different 1% of the inputs has an advantage on a different 1% of the inputs. And so we're going to like start combining these different hypotheses into, um, into a stronger and stronger function. 
predictor for the for function. Okay. So, um, okay. In the 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 property of boosting is that if the weak learner always finds a hypothesis with some positive small co positive correlation, then the strong learner computes the function. In relatively few iterations, the strong learner computes the function almost everywhere. Okay. Um, because the reduction I gave is, is algorithmic, every boosting algorithm that guarantees that the density of the distributions queried is at least uh, 2 delta uh, gives an algorithmic hard course at lemma. Okay. And, uh, and we said that every algorithmic set hard core set lemma gives an algorithmic dense model theorem. Okay. Um, and what that algorithmic dense model theorem is going to do is either I'll put a model that's simple and is indistinguishable from the, from the target distribution, or giving a counterexample to pseudo density that pins the target distribution down in a small region of space. Okay. If the and of course if the if the um, model is actually dense, it can't come up with a second alternative, so it's definitely going to come up with a simple model. Okay. So the algorithms that you get, I'm going to like actually show you the them in a in a minute, is a uh, is very similar in flavor, if not in detail, to the generative adversarial networks that, that's very popular these days, uh, uh, introduced by Goodfellow et al. And uh, so the, the generative adversarial networks, you can think of as two learning algorithms. One is playing the role of an art critic, trying to distinguish between real art, real great art, and forgeries. And the other playing the role of the forger, trying to learn how to forge great art that the critic won't be able to tell the, be able to tell. Okay, and so they the uh, again is kind of a competition between these two different learning algorithms. And uh, in GANs, you have like both learning algorithms are neural nets, and there's kind of a, a fixed feedback loop between them. We're going to not use the same kind of necessarily the same kind of learning algorithms or the same kind of feedback loop, but we're also going to be having this. Um, this kind of feedback between a learning component, uh, a distinguishing component, and a, a forging component, a generation algorithm. Okay. Okay. So the um, so I call to say that it's similar to, to GANs without saying it's identical. I call this a generation through adversarial boosting or GAB. Okay. Um, so we're going to give a particular strategy. By modifying any boosting algorithm with density guarantees, we'll, we'll give a strategy where the critic finds either a narrow criteria for always uh, for genuine samples, or the forger finds a way of creating high entropy samples that fool the the critic. Very random samples. Okay, so um, in the in the GAN type algorithm. We're going to use the forger is going to simulate the boosting algorithm, and the critic is going to simulate the weak learner. Okay, um, so the forger produces a candidate distribution as the boosting algorithm would. the The critic produces a distinguishing test H i in response. You know, if it's not already fooled. The forger C then uses this as the response in the in the in the boosting algorithm to um, to produce the next distribution. Okay, and, and by the you know leveraging the conditions of the boosting algorithm, we know that in relatively few iterations, either the critic fails and the 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 uh, the forger wins, produce, produces valid indistinguishable samples, or um, the boosting algorithm produces a, uh, a strong hypothesis, which is going to be the counterexample to pseudo-entropy. To pseudo-density, I mean. Okay. So this means that, um, that 
by using the best boosting algorithm for this situation that we know, we actually get uh, we actually get pretty strong uh, algorithms for generation by adversarial boosting um, that do this kind of GAN-like task, um, and it also like reduces the number of iterations to be very small and gives kind of improved regularity lemmas as a consequence. OK. So, um, so let me just go into detail and just say, you know, what, what we, you know, we're presenting this as a kind of chain of reductions. What would the algorithm actually look like when you're done? Uh, and it's actually not so, so, um, so complicated. Okay. So, um, so we have a, uh, we're assuming we've got a distinguisher that takes in a distribution D in, a, in a, sorry, the distribution, samples from the distribution we're trying to model and a description of the distribution D and produces a hypothesis where you, it's, that hypothesis is just somewhat more likely on the actual distribution than the, the, the forged distribution. Okay. Um, now, we're not making any assumptions. Of this. We're treating this distinguisher totally as a black box, just like the weak learner is in boosting. So it could be a, a neural net. doesn't have to be. It could be stateless. It doesn't have to be. It could be stateful. It doesn't have to be. Okay. Um, so occasionally, in some settings like graphs, we, we want to actually, there's kind of an optimal algorithm to, to, to run, to use as the distinguisher. But most situations, you want to just use some heuristic. Um, and maybe neural nets are the best. Okay. And we have this distinguisher playing the role of the critic. Okay. So then um, we're going to make, we say we're going to need to give the critic distributions to distinguish. Here's going to be the form of the distribution. So um, I'm going to take my hypotheses that the, the, the the learner has produced so far, and give each x a score. Okay? And the score is plus 1 if the hypothesis is correct, minus 1 if the hypothesis says that it looks, that it, so plus 1 if it looks like s, minus 1 if it looks like something not from s. Okay? And so we'll add up those scores for the different uh, hypotheses that the weak learner has produced so far, and that gives us a total score. We're not going to just use that total score. We'll have some uh, variable v that's kind of like Holenstein's contribution to the whole mess that, that is required for the proof, makes things just a little bit more complicated. v is going to like normalize the scores. We're just going to subtract off v uh, regardless. Okay? But v is going to change throughout the boosting algorithm in a kind of subtle way. Okay. And then we're going to take that score and compute an exponential function with, you know, multiply it by e and compute an exponential function. So we're dropping, we're sort of having every 1 in e uh, scores. Okay, so we're just gradually dropping uh, if it looks, if it, we're making the probability a little bit smaller if it, can, if it constantly says that this is not looking s-like. Okay? If it's looking s-like, then we cap it at 1. So to make sure that we're in the range 1 to 0. Yeah. Tony? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> you're changing it. Yeah, in some, in some sense. Yeah, you're making, because we, we, we decrease V, which makes it... Um, Yeah, maybe that's a good analogy. I have to, I'd have to think about it. <laughs> okay, and so then uh, we just take the the score, subtract v, and then apply this exponential function. So things that are that are looking very s-like are are have have measure one. As it looks less and less s-like, the probability, the weight that we're giving it drops exponentially, and we're picking according to these weights. Okay, So that's what the distribution looks like. And then uh, 
then. So that's the distribution that's being chosen by not the critic, but the other. That's right. So this is the forger strategy is given by that formula for the distribution. Um, with one caveat is so we have to explain when do you change v that that as Tony says a cooling parameter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so you you set t to be the the number of iterations that we'll need according to the analysis. You initialize v to be log of one over d, so that initially everything has measure d. Okay. Uh, I guess it should be like maybe epsilon. I should have put an uh, one over epsilon here, okay, so that everything has has measured d, uh, and then you repeat t times or until the distinguisher fails. Is you, you know, well if the distinguisher fails, then you're done. That you're after this distribution and you that's indistinguishable and you found it. Okay. Otherwise, you the distinguisher produce some hypothesis with with a good correlation, you take that hypothesis, you um, you um, you uh, add it to the, your collection, and that modifies the the measure a little bit, maybe like multiplies or divides things by uh, a, like a one plus epsilon uh, amount. Um, that could drop the density that re of the distribution. Okay? And we want to keep the density at least d. So if the density drops, then we decrement v, to, and that will bring the density uh, back up. Uh, uh, you know, doesn't sort of change the relative scores, but um, brings the density back up above d. Okay? It's not completely obvious, but, but it's also not difficult to show that this works. Um, and when we're done, uh, we, we have to like go into Hohenstein thesis and see that there's going to be some threshold function that we can use uh, where uh, we, can, it, we have a counterexample to pseudo density of the form. If the sum of the hypothesis is bigger than some threshold, then, then that defines the region. Yes. Yeah. So that's tell the NSF to yeah, to fund our proposal, and maybe in five years we'll know. Thing we're yeah. 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 So. Uh, so yeah, so we, the the, it seems like, yes, they're they're sort of like. I I guess either way, you need about like one the one over epsilon squared comes in because of the the law you know the the the, the, deviation of the normal distribution. Yeah. The thing yeah. Be so you need you know if the hypotheses are just like independent giving you an epsilon advantage, you're going to need to combine about 1 over epsilon squared of them to have a good advantage. Yeah. Is it like improving, let's say I give you neural net uh, of certain bounded width, could you get it to, I mean, it should be less than the VC dimension? Or so, the, so this is independent of VC dimension, actually. So nothing here. Uh, requires T to have the class of tests to have a bounded VC dimension. Uh, and nothing, no constants are sensitive to the class of tests. So it's just an absolute constant. All that matters is epsilon and delta. So I mean, intuitively, the richer, the richer the class of tests, the stronger the assumption of pseudo density is. So it kind of makes up for itself. Yeah. Use, yeah. Trying to mimic the distribution of actual paintings or actual right. images that humans have. Right. So now, 
does it mean that I have to know that distribution, like this distribution u zero v of x equals d? So we need to we need some starting distribution. Now, the more you know about the starting distribution, uh, um, the better things are going to be. So the, the main issue might be that if you've got something, if re, you have got like the uniform distribution is just random splashes of paint on the you know, random pixels, then even for pseudo density, pictures of, you know, the Mona Lisa is going to have <laughs> um, amazingly small pseudo density. Almost anything can tell, tell the difference. Okay, so, um, so then your factor delta is going to be too small and not only are you not going to be able to run this enough iterations, the number of iterations only grows as log 1 over delta, even that's not so bad, but remember that the sampling time is 1 over delta. Uh, so you, you, if, you, if you can somehow say, okay, let me make a, a parameterization of the distribution so that we're already talking about pictures of faces, and now we want to like talk about pictures of uh, Russell's face, then you know that's going to have a much higher pseudo density within the space of pictures of all, all uh, of the parameterization of pictures of faces than it would over random splotches of paint. Well, it has to do with this method. I don't know enough about Gans to say whether it's true. So, yeah. You, can can I, but maybe, uh, okay, so, okay, actually, uh, okay, maybe I go to this slide, <laughs> which I think addresses some of your points. <laughs> yeah, so here, here are some, so, if the, if the uniform distribution isn't kind of reasonable, then this value of density can be really small. He here are a few things we thought of to, to like try to, to fix the situation. One is to start, I think like the best would be to start with a parameterization of the space that, um, that uh, makes the density higher. Second would be to use like a SAT solving algorithm as a heuristic for sampling rather than um, rather than actually doing rejection sampling, or um, or uh, you, we could try applying the idea recursively. Once we find a smaller space, use that space as the next universe. Um, did this answer? You? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> I think, uh, so if, if I remove the pseudo from their density, yeah. say for as example that my assumption is on actual density instead of pseudo density, the then is it the same as like uh, uh, maximize uh, entropy, like maximum entropy okay. program? So mm -hmm. it, it, it's not, um, let, me, let me talk about that, okay? So what we get from this is that we either find a distribution of density, at least D, that fools the, fools, uh, the distinguisher, or we sort of give a guarantee that no such distribution exists. Okay, a single strategy for the distinguisher that that shows that the distribution is not dense. Okay, so um, now in, in GANs um, themselves run into the following problem. Uh, at least some of the time, they can be set up so that the 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 function they're trying to minimize. The, even when they find the, the, the minimum solution, it has relatively small entropy compared to the underlying distribution. Uh, and in fact, uh, Aurora and Shang uh, showed that this can actually happen uh, in actual runs of GANs. Um, okay. so, uh, so why is this an issue? Well, you want like a, to train your GAN to generate random a computer generating random pictures of cats. Here I used a computer algorithm to generate this picture of cats. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. So the, what was the algorithm? It was Google Images. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
So we don't want to cheat and just <laughs> like store images and replay them. <laughs> OK. So um, <laughs> OK. So we'd like, we'd like and, and sort of like in the scientific example, we'd like to categorize not the butterflies that we've seen, but the butterflies that could exist. Right? So we want to say the, so if we're subsampling from one distribution from another, we want to actually generate the larger distribution, not the smaller one. Okay? So, um, so to handle this, um, we give a modification of this algorithm that I just showed that sort of uses uh, the hypothesis so far as also to, to, to look for distinguishers that are defined in terms, in a simple way, in terms of those hypotheses. Um, okay, so um, and what we what we um, get is a guarantee that the distribution that we'll find um, is is actually both indistinguishable and has the um, at least the entropy of the source distribution or any distribution that's uh, indistinguishable from the source distribution. Yeah, I know we're over time. Oh, there's another talk. OK. I thought I was just keeping people from lunch, which is a serious <laughs> enough crime. OK. So what we can do is modify the algorithm so that we have a theoretical guarantee that whatever we learn actually has as much entropy as the distribution. So in, some, in at least that one narrow sense, we're outperforming GANs. OK. Uh, OK. So. Um, we can continue tomorrow, but um, just want to, I guess, say the conclusion is I'm done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>